spondylodesis. In this presentation, bisegmental posterior lumbar stabilization will be performed using the Expedium spine system. My name is Lauren Benecker. I'm head of the spine unit at the Inserspital, the University Hospital of Bern in Switzerland, one of the largest hospitals in the country where we treat all types of spine pathologies. So the learning objectives of this exercise is that you should be able to perform a mono or bisegmental posterior lumbar stabilization with the Expedium spine system. You should be able to safely place pedicle screws in L4 to S1 in a sawbone model and to perform basic correction maneuvers as distraction, compression and AP reduction of a slight spondylolisthesis. The first posterior pedicle screw systems were introduced in 1969 by Harrington and Tulis for the correction of a spondylolisthesis. At that time the screws were fixed to the rods with wires in combination with clamps. The system was improved by Roy Akami by the introduction of a posterior plate which was further developed by Steffi and co-workers in the 80s where he introduced a double nut system for a rigid connection of the screws to the plate. These screws were difficult to place and showed a lot of toggling resulting in early screw loosening or breakage. In 1988 Cottrell and Dubusset introduced their rod pedicle system which is the blueprint of all modern use posterior pedicle systems available. It has been shown that pedicle screw systems significantly improve the stability and also the outcome of posterior spinal fusion surgery. The indications include degenerative disc disease and spinal instability. It's used for revision procedures for post-discectomy syndrome and for pseudotrosis or failed spondylodesis in infections with instability and for degenerative or isthmic spondylodesis as well as for trauma. It's usually used in combination with an interbody fusion device as a T-lift, P-lift or X-lift cage. Now let me illustrate this with a case example. We have here a male retired farmer, 78 years old. He underwent a decompression surgery on the levels L2 to L5 eight years earlier and presents now with a back pain of VAS 7 to 9, but only when standing or walking. He also has some radicular pain, VAS 0 to 6, which is only present when his spine is loaded, and his most severe complaints are claudication with a limited walking distance of below 300 meters due to pain and fatigue. Since his early surgery, he has a M2 paresis for his, right foot, uh, for his left foot elevation and a recent M4 paresis on the right side. He's not a healthy patient with slight overweight and also a 3 due to coronary heart disease and a diabetes mellitus type 2. Here you see the preoperative x-rays of this patient with a PI of 60 degrees, sacral slope 43 degrees, pelvic tilt 17 degrees and a slightly reduced lumbar lordosis of 54 degrees. He shows a first grade spondylolisthesis on the segment L4-5 and has a slight degenerative scoliosis of 28 degrees measured between L1 and 4. On the flexion extension images you see that there's a preserved mobility on the levels L3-4 and L4-5 of 6 degrees each and the segments above and below appear to be stiff. The preoperative MRI, you can see severe central and neuroforaminal stenosis due to facet hypertrophy and disc protrusions. In the preoperative setting, we performed uh, diagnostic facet blocks with no or minimal effect on the level L2-3 and a significant effect on the levels L3-4, L4-5, but without a lasting effect. So we went into a surgical theater and performed a posterior open approach and placed expedium pedicle screws in L3-5. We performed a re-decompression L2-5, unfortunately with an incidental durotomy, which was sutured immediately. We performed T-lift cages, L3-4 and L4-5 filled with local bone coming from the concave side and to finish up performed the posterior stabilization 
with posterior lateral fusion, again with local bone, L3 to 5. The whole procedure took 3.5 hours with 450 milliliters of blood loss. So here you can see the post-operative standing x-rays one week after the surgery. The patient stayed seven days in hospital. The cup angle L1 to 4 was improved from 28 degrees to 15. The lumbar lordosis increased from 54 degrees to 60. Most importantly, his back pain was significantly reduced to VAS3 and the leg pain was gone completely. His walking distance increased to over 1,000 meters and was no longer restricted by his back problem. The foot drop on the left stayed at M2. All the other neurological fun functions improved completely. In the practical exercise that follows, the previously described clinical situation will be simulated. The patient is positioned prone on a radio-lucent table on two horizontally placed padded bolsters, one at the level of the sternum and another one at the level of the anterior iliac spine, or a frame. To avoid increased intra-abdominal pressure and prevent excessive venous bleeding, the abdomen should hang free. Adequate padding needs to be provided to prevent pressure sores at the elbows and knees. To avoid pressure on the eyes, the head is rested in either a horseshoe ring or a Mayfield rest. For fixations that start below T8, the arms can be abducted and should be resting comfortably at a 90 degree position of the shoulder and elbow. Preoperative fluoroscopy is mandatory. Before draping, ensure that both AP and lateral fluoroscopy views are possible with the C-arm for all levels that are to be instrumented. Once the patient is positioned, the affected vertebrae are checked with the image intensifier to ensure they are seen clearly in both AP and lateral planes. Pedicle screw placement. The required instruments for screw placement are the Liston bone cutters, the pedicle awl, the teardrop handle, the pedicle probe with spherical handle, the ball tip feeler, the depth gauge, and the quick connect polyaxial screwdriver. The entry point for the pedicle screw in the lumbar vertebrae is in the midline of the transverse process and slightly lateral to the superior articular facet. The entry point of the thoracic vertebrae is at the mammillary process. The superficial cortex of the entry point is opened with a pedicle awl. A pedicle probe is used to navigate down the isthmus of the pedicle into the vertebral body. The appropriate cranial caudal trajectory is perpendicular to the lamina, aiming to be parallel to the superior end plate. The depth and the integrity of the medial pedicle wall is checked using the ball tip feeler. When using a curved pedicle finder, aiming it laterally for the first 15 millimeters helps to prevent medial penetration into the spinal canal. Once it has passed the posterior wall of the vertebra, the pedicle finder can be aimed medially to obtain a more convergent screw trajectory, which allows for a longer screw and better purchase in the bone. To increase stability when the bone of the sacrum is osteoporotic, by cortical screw placement can be considered. The screw length is measured using the depth gauge. Polyaxial screws have a fully threaded tapered tip, minimizing the need to tap. However, taps are provided for surgeon preference. The T20 driver tip is placed into the T20 feature in the screw shank. The screwdriver sleeve is slid down and threaded into the head of the screw. The screw is inserted. Take care not to over-tighten the screws. Over-tightening can result in the loss of polyaxiality and, by stripping the thread, reduce screw purchase. The screw height is adjusted by turning the assembly counterclockwise.
To disengage the screw, the screwdriver sleeve must be unthreaded. In a clinical situation, at any point in the process, radiographic confirmation can be obtained. Five remaining screws are inserted in the same manner. Rod insertion and reduction. The required instruments for insertion and reduction are the rod clamp, the single innie inserter X25, the flex clip reducer assembly comprised of the clip-on device, the reduction tube, the teardrop handle, and the reduction inserter. The instruments for tightening are the rod stabilizer, the torque shaft, and the torque wrench handle. The rod with appropriate length and the desired lordosis is chosen and placed into the polyaxial screw heads using the rod clamp. The rod is captured into the implant by inserting the single innies on L3 and L5 on both sides. To begin rod reduction, the clip-on device is attached to the top notch feature at the top of the polyaxial screw head on L4 and locked. The reduction tube is threaded into the clip-on device to fully seat the rod. The single innie is inserted using the reduction inserter, but not fully tightened. The flex clip reducer assembly is removed and the same procedure is done on L4 on the right side. In cases of severe listhesis, the reduction should be performed simultaneously on both sides. The single innies are fully tightened using the tightening instruments assembly. The shaft is inserted through the rod stabilizer into the single innie. The T-handle is rotated clockwise until it clicks and resistance is no longer evident. Once the rod has been captured into all of the polyaxial screw heads, compression and distraction maneuvers can be easily accomplished by loosening the single innie, performing the maneuver, and retightening. The required instruments for compression and distraction are the compressor, the distractor, the rod stabilizer, the torque shaft, and the torque wrench handle. Compressive forces are applied and the single innie is fully tightened after compression is accomplished. This procedure is repeated on the opposite side. If necessary, distractive forces are applied 
and the single innie is fully tightened after distraction has been achieved. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the practical exercise and let me summarize the exercise with these take-home messages. As you can see, posterior pedicle screw-based systems provide the best stability and best outcome in spinal fusion surgery. The best results are seen in combination with an interbody fusion device as a T-lift, P-lift or X-lift. And even with polyactyl screws, basic correction maneuvers are possible. But for more severe correction or trauma cases, I prefer monoaxial or dual any screw systems. I urge you do not over tighten those screws. You will in one way lose the polyaxiality and by breakage of the thread you can face early screw loosening. As always, be aware of osteoporosis. If this is present, use multiple levels or think about cement augmentation of your screws. Thank you very much.